Hello. So today's talk is cancelled. Uh, I, um, so I went to the sponsorship thing last night and realised I had the wrong talk for you folks. So um, uh, the, talk, the new talk will have the same URL as before, tiny.cc slash, uh, tiny slash code, uh, if you want to know the slides that have come from there. And um, uh, uh, I realised I needed to give you guys another talk. The talk I want to give you is what happens after data mining. I know you folks are doing a lot of stuff with data mining, but um, one of my mottos is the more I test data miners, the less I want to use them. So I want to talk about another kind of technology. But the interesting thing is there'll be a bridge from data mining into this other kind of technology. So I think there's a theme for today, and the theme for today is we don't like the top line. We don't like load, then predict, and then we just end. We really want to do something like the bottom line, which is we load and then we improve. And my statement to you is if we combine data mining and optimizers, we can do loading data and then improving something. Uh, now, we were told this morning to, be very, to validate things. We were told things like accuracy are very, very misleading. Another test I really like to do is if I've got some data, I'll run the whole rig 20 times using 90% of the data picked at random. I invite you to consider what happened when I did that to learn a, a linear regression expression, these are the beta coefficients, and these are the beta coefficients seen in 20 repeats of a software effort estimation uh, a project. Now, the interesting thing here, oh, and there are 24 attributes in this particular model. Now, you see this red line? That's beta equals zero. And I invite you to consider the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven variables that cross from beta equals zero, less than zero, to beta above zero in, the, in, in that data. So this data contains inherent uncertainties. Now, once I start seeing this, I start saying to myself, I need to start building my models from attributes that are more stable, that have less change. Like this one here is very, very stable, lines of code. So suddenly, I want to build models, and I want to validate them and test them, not on accuracy, but on the, the attributes as low as variance. And if I go back to business users and talk about it, they say, well, if we're going to monitor this stuff, we want the attributes that are cheapest to collect and monitor. Then we also want to reduce model invariance. Um, and we start moving beyond data mining. Data miners typically have a hardwired success criteria into them. Decision tree learners like to minimize entropy. Linear regression devices like to re reduce error. And we do have methods for turning those hardwired goals into other things. Uh, some of you know cost-sensitive learning, but that's like micro-changes. I want a framework where I can put the user goals into the learner from day one. And so the whole process is controlled by the user goals. We were also pointed out, we were given examples this morning of things that are not a data mining problem. Prioritize a list that's 100 lines long was the example given. I think that's a perfect optimization problem, a perfect configuration problem. What I want to talk to you about today is ways we can move data miners into optimizers so that we can do things like configure 100 choices. And we were also told that trust is an important problem. I want to talk about how to put optimizers and data miners together such that the resulting system is more explicable, more trustable. Uh, just some things about myself. I'm a professor at NC State. I get money. For, some people were kind enough to give me some money, more fools. I've got perhaps too many graduate students. Uh, the lab I've got is ai.4se.net, and these are the people I work with at NC State. And we spend our entire time thinking about how to lever the synergy between AI and software engineering. Not just AI for software engineering, but software engineering for AI for software engineering. So we're often doing mass, uh, mashups and reconfigurations of existing AI tools into new and exciting ideas. So I'm going to make a prediction about the future. Uh, one thing you expect from professors, well, there's two things you expect from professors. Firstly, they make crazed predictions about the future. The second is, at probability 0.7, they're going to be wrong. So I'd like to offer you my, my possibly wrong prediction about the future. And my prediction about the future is we're going to see less data mining and more optimizing, and more optimizing plus data mining combined. So the technology you're dealing with is great for beginners. But let's talk about what happens when you graduate. So I want to say that when we use our standard data miners, they have problems handling certain kinds of business goals. Three or four slides ago, I showed you a linear regression problem where you want to start changing the models that are learned using attributes that satisfy more criteria, cheaper to collect, less variance. 
Um, uh, I don't like standard optimizing technology. Those of you familiar with uh, non-parametric optimizers like genetic algorithms know their associated runtimes. And when I started putting data miners into, into uh, standard optimizers, I found incredible speed ups, orders of magnitude speed up in standard optimization methods. And so I really think that these technologies combined are much more useful than apart. So I talk about Duo, and Duo is data miners used by or using optimizers. Duo, D-U-O. Data miners used by or using optimizers. And um, I want to make a case to you that it's a powerful idea. Now, uh, commercially, uh, uh, you have your own definitions of what's powerful and useful. As an academic, I have to say, I think something's useful if I can turn loose a whole army of graduate students on it and I can show them a bunch of literature and they can get irritated about how stupid the prior results were or inspired by how great those results were. I think it's important that these, we have examples that this technology has addressed important business concerns and has promised for future business concerns. I want to say it, it has, should illustrate some core ideas. It shouldn't be uh, just a clever hack. It should go right down to the core of what's going on. And also, it should offer something where, where simple solutions are possible so that beginners adopting this technology actually have something to do. And also, not only should it offer meat for the, for, meat for the meek, simple solutions, it should offer meat for the mighty, people that want to take an idea and push it through into fantastic new ideas. So first, also, so I want to talk about an idea that I think is well-founded in literature right now, very recent research literature, something I can throw graduate students at, and they can do their own work and get inspired or irritated by the prior work. If we go to uh, Google Scholar, ACM Portal, IEEE Explorer, and if we look for recent papers talking about data mining and optimization and software engineering, and then look at all papers that get, say, 10 citations a year if it's Google, or three citations a year if it's IEEE Explorer or ACM, we find these nine papers, these further 10 papers, these further 11 papers, that explore in the recent literature this combination of data mining and optimizing and software engineering. And if you ask what's in them, we should ask what optimizers are there, what data miners are there, uh, how are they combined, what domain do they work in, what problem do they address, and what's the take home message of it all, well that's the rest of this talk. So in the corpus that we're looking at, we find learners like decision tree learners support vector machines, various instance based methods, ensemble, Bayesians, regressions, neural networks, dimensionality reduction methods, and then very rarely deep learning, because deep learning is at the computationally expensive end, and I just like doing things much faster than deep learning. And if we look at when these papers were published, we can see, I can't, I can't put a regression line to this and show you, but I'm seeing overall number of papers increasing, increasing in this particular area. That's the data mining side. On the optimization side, we see algorithms like genetic algorithms, something called differential evolution. If you, who knows what NSGA2 is? NSGA2 is the linear regression of optimization. It's the sort of go-to everyone go, if you want a, a, a supposedly standard genetic algorithm that isn't a simplistic 1980s Holland implementation, NSGA2 is, it's the linear regression of, 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 of optimization. Differential evolution and particle swarm optimization, I don't have time to go into those today, but let me assure you that differential evolution and particle swarm optimization are so quick to code. You know, sit down with me for five minutes, I'll give you a complete spec. Code them in Python in 30 lines of code. And it's not some diamond where if you change one thing it breaks, like the quadratic optimizer inside SVM. Instead, so differential evolution and, and, and particle swarm optimization are things that people can creatively get into and use them as a workbench to explore different ideas. Now, if you don't know some of these other methods, it's because they're really recent research ideas. Uh, and just caveat, uh, MTAR, Sway, Flash, these are things from my lab. And here you see um, uh, 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 how when these, these algorithms were applied. Uh, now, uh, genetic algorithms are the standard thing where there's generations. And each generation you mutate some candidates. And you do crossover, mummy loves daddy, so they, the kids are generated with bits of mummy and bits of daddy. And the, the best ones are those are selected, which go into generation I plus one. And, and, and the typical numbers for genetic algorithms are 100 people in the population, 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 generations. So GAs have a long execution time. Okay, so I think I can show you something which I think is well-founded in the literature. 
Now, do these, do these papers I'm talking about address anything you give a damn about? What sort of business problems do they address? Well, in the literature, these are the papers, these are the sort of things addressed by these papers. So, uh, project management, uh, effort estimation, uh, requirements. Um, uh, one of the standard uh, multi-objective problems is um, uh, you've got all these features to be delivered over the next N releases. Sometimes you have to deliver features that the user don't, doesn't care about because you're putting down a foundation for subsequent work. So feature decision, feature planning of your next end releases is one of these wonderful, complex, non-linear optimization problems. Very, next release planning is a very standard problem. Uh, design product lines, who, you know, who's ever seen a feature model, a feature map? Feature map, one person, thank you, two people, thank you so much. So there's a, there's a high level notation about 7,000 levels above UML called feature models and it describes the features of a project. And some of these features are contradictory with other features. So the idea is you're planning what to do from these high level feature maps. Uh, these um, these um, multi-objective optimization methods that I love do things like uh, they configure intrusion detection devices. So standard uh, uh, data miners applied to uh, uh, standard source code aren't the best at picking intrusion detection because of the rarity problem. Typically in intrusion detection data sets, the target class is very rare. And it turns out that these optimization algorithms that I like are very good at fine tuning uh, 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 anomaly detectors, very good for that. Uh, software quality, uh, defect prediction, Test case generation, a very standard problem in the, in the, in the search-based software engineering field is to come up with the fewest number of tests that cover the most number of features and most number of pass bugs that run in the quickest time. That's one of these multi-objective optimization problems. And that's a standard technology in this field. Software configuration, um, uh, take anything, take um, uh, SQL Lite. There are 10 to the nine options inside SQL lights make files. If you list them all out, multiply all the combinations, there are 10 to the nine ways. And for you to work out what's the best way to configure SQL lite, no one has time to compile SQL lite 10 to the nine times and run the whole test suite to get the performance criteria. So the goal in that game is active learning, where you find the most informative next example to run. And I'll show you active learning methods in this framework. A, t uh, a lot of text mining methods, um, topic modeling, configuring topic modeling for handling, um, uh, you're exploring some text corpus. Um, the standard examples here all come from Stack Overflow and you're saying things like, is this question like any others? Um, a lot of stuff in this area. So these are the sort of problems that we see explored by this combination of data mining and, and optimization. So we're seeing something now that the, these problems may or may not interest you, but uh, there's some information here that this is actually addressing what some people might call interesting business concerns. Now, do they illustrate an important core principle? Is this just dancing around on some new idea? Or is there some fundamental principle that goes deep, deep, deep to the heart of everything we're doing today? And what we're gonna say is yes. If we actually go right into these algorithms, into their deepest heart, Data mining and optimization are almost the same thing. If we open the black box and look inside an optimizer, there's typically a landscape. The dimensions here are things you're trying to optimize for. And not all solutions are possible. The solutions form a landscape and you literally put on a set of skis with an optimizer and you try to surf down the landscape to find a really good place. Okay, now if you're instantly thinking about a neural net trying to minimize its error as it approaches the target, you're thinking like an optimizer. And so if, we're, if you're talking about uh, project management and you want to do things the least amount of time and get the most amount of profit because you're de delivering the most functionality, this is a, called a Pareto frontier. And a Pareto frontier are the space of options that nothing's better than. So if you do some initial random guessing, here's this green line of some initial nice ideas. If you're a genetic algorithm, you'll take these solutions and not all the ones down below it and start combining them to get the red line for generation two. And the ones that are really good there in the combination, you combine into generation three. And ideally, you get up here to the, to the, to the heaven point of fantastic profit developed in no time at all. And that, that, that's, that's the model for um, data mining, for optimization. Now, if we look inside a data miner, 
we see the same landscape surface. A mental model for data mining is there is a box containing all the options you're trying to explore, and all the examples you've got form islands inside that box. And you're trying to build to find walls in between those islands. And the interesting problem here, of course, is that sometimes things don't live inside one wall, they leak across. And so once you've got this landscape knowledge, what the optimizer does is it puts on skis and starts skiing down the slope. And what the data miner does is it cuts up the space and reports this, and it offers you a succinct summary of each part of the space. But until you get to skiing and until you get to cutting, data mining and optimization is the same thing. Um, um, I alluded to this before. If you do a neural net and you're doing back propagation to improve the learning, you're walking your solutions down to some minimum error point. And, if the, and the language of a neural net is very much like an optimizer. As you mutate your current solutions and going down, 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 if you go too fast, your solution will jump over the minimum point and go bounce, bounce, bounce. Think of a, take any bowl and put a marble in it. I want you to go zoom, 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 zoom. And if you go too slow with the marble, you might get stuck on a local maxima and never find that down the way. This is the language of neural nets. This is the language of optimization. This language also applies not just to numeric representations, but to symbolic representations. If here are all the negative examples, and here are all the positive examples, where's heaven? x-axis is all the negative examples, y-axis is all the positive examples, where's heaven? You said a line, one point. One point top left, where you cover all the positive examples and none of the negative examples. Here's heaven right here. I'm now going to build you a learner that will recognize Australians. It's absolutely perfect. Australian if true. It will detect all the Australians in this room. Any other Australians in this room? Okay, wow, thank you. Two Australians, well done. Good day, mate. Okay, now what's wrong with that, with that, with that predictor? Are there any non-Australians in this room? It's got a very high false alarm. So this Australian, if true, scores a very high false alarm, a very high, it detects all the Australians, but all the rest of you are labeled Aussies. Okay, let's fix it up. Let's say Australian, if false. No Australian in this room is found. So everyone's not an Australian. That's great, no false alarms. But what's wrong with that model? It doesn't find any Australians. When we start putting conditions into rules, when we decide Australian if, um, who was the other Australian? Ah, yes, Australian if bald, okay? Australian if very nice. Can you see I'm adding conditions? And as I add those conditions, I'm walking what's called the receiver operator curve. I'm doing optimization when I do rule learning. I do optimization when I do neural net learning. I do optimization when I do data mining. So I, I, I submit to you that this idea of putting together data mining and optimizing actually illustrates a core computational principle. Okay, now is this a field that if I give you this insight, can you do anything with it? Is it so complicated to apply this idea called duo of data mining and optimizing that, you know, there's just nothing you could do with it. You know, um, who, who remembers um, university programming language? They talk about the lambda calculus and, and unification. And, you know, yeah, it's true, but there's no way on God's green earth I'm ever going to use it, uh, comma, unless you're actually using SQL or JavaScript, but we won't talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about people that have applied these methods to, very, to, to improve data miners dramatically. These people use a technique called grid search, which is literally, if you're optimizing all these different parameters for a learner, just try every one of them at different levels of a for loop. What do you think of the properties of a grid search? Do you think a grid search would be fast or slow? Crazy slow. Okay, these people have to use a lot of cloud compute. These are all these different learners running on defect prediction methods, and they've got something that says you're one of the best ones. And depending on what data sets you use, sometimes you're best and sometimes you're not. So there's some variance in your behavior. Now, these blue dots are the performance of these learners before you do any optimization, before the grid search tries to fiddle with the control parameters. And here you see C5 and a bunch of neural networks. And what's their pre-tuning behavior? How well are they doing before I tune? See the zero here? They're terrible. 
They're absolutely appalling. Now look at their behavior after I tuned. See that, that, that red triangle right there? After tuning, this learner looked absolutely terrible. Pre-tuning is, is not just doing much better than pre-tuning, but doing better than anything else. So here is these top three uh, blue dots are some of the best results after tuning. So tuning is really important. We just have to handle the uh, speed problem. And the grid search is not hard to code. Um, uh, uh, Frederica Saro at ICSI 2016, she started talking about multi-objective project management methods, where she wanted to say, I want to decrease the error of my predictions and the variance of those predictions. Remember before, uh, slide two or three, I had this problem with variance in my beta coefficients. She says that could lead to wildly changing outputs. She's implementing that with a standard optimizer, NSGA2, remember that linear regression device? And uh, it's not linear regression, it's just linear regression when you're doing optimizing. And she found she could do very, very well in predicting, and, and when she compared it with human levels of performance doing effort estimation, she got superior than human level performance at effort estimation by combining an optimizer with a, uh, with a uh, data miner. So I think that what I'm talking about here illustrates not just core principles, but also offers very simple, what's this? Okay, now here are some, solu here are some fascinating examples illustrating the power of doing data mining and optimization. Uh, the first one, uh, from my lab, uh, here we're doing much better than genetic algorithms. And here, our optimizer, in quotes, is actually going to be a recursive descent algorithm. Now, to understand this example, this is something we usually do with genetic algorithms because it's a, a non-parametric space, mixed numbers and, 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 and letters. So a genetic algorithm, in, instead of having an initial population of, say, 100 examples, we produced 10,000 random examples. And we didn't do the standard genetic algorithm stuff. We didn't mutate anything. And we didn't do population I plus 1. All we did was a down select on the initial population of 10,000. And we did, um, if you know the fast map heuristic for finding two distant points, we'd find the two most distant points in the space and only evaluate those. So in terms of actually having to go to a domain expert or actually running an example, only the two most remote points. One of them was better than the other, so we threw away half the data. Then in this space here, we found the two most remote points threw away half the data, this space here. Notice that each pruning only requires two evaluations of these spaces. So if, for 10,000 examples, we're only doing like 20 to 40 evaluations. You can see the, the, the binary chop here. We've decided that uh, the top end's best, so down we go here, the bottom end's best, here we are here. Now, this particular algorithm has been compared against numerous other optimizers, and these are all these problems. Now, some of these are these silly, um, lab problems, like in, um, in, in data mining, I guess, IRIS, the IRIS data set is a silly lab problem. You know, in, 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 um, in optimization, uh, uh, Fonseca and Shrivener are those little two, three line pieces of code. CDA is a massive great model of pilots flying a plane, landing a plane in adverse, in adverse weather. It's uh, NASA Ames. They're using it with the, um, Civil Aviation Authority to determine policies of people flying planes when they land it. It's a massive great model. It would take them eight hours to run the model. And with our methods, it would take seven minutes. And that would mean that instead of having to spend months to do their analysis, they got basically through it in a weekend. I asked them, why are you talking to me? You've got a supercomputer building across the way, like literally at dawn, the supercomputer sh building shadow would fall across the office of where I was standing with this NASA person. And she said, yeah, you know what happens with that supercomputing facility? Every time there's an incident on a NASA flight mission, all the scientists get thrown off the supercomputer, and they use all their available CPU to work to do what-if queries to work out whether they need to do anything with the spaceship. We can't get the CPU we want to do all the options we want to explore. So my little hack that could run on a laptop was a godsend to them. Now, um, this, this little, each of these squares is 250 evaluations. So for all these models, my method called Gale does things in, you know, a couple of dozen evaluations, whereas all these other methods use hundreds to thousands of evaluations. So putting a data miner into the optimizer was a crazy way to improve the optimization. And in terms of performance scores, the gray bars are where we're as good or, or as good 
or better than anything else, and we're usually good as better than else. So stop using genetic algorithms, augment the genetic algorithm with a data miner, oh, hang on, throw away the GA. That was our sequence. We thought the GA is too slow, too slow to run. So use a data miner to chop up the space and do tiny steps inside the space. And then as a mistake, we made a mistake. The, the GA never ran, and we ran perfectly. Perfect example of the data miner acting as an optimizer. Uh, here, here's another example where the data miner controls the optimizer, and this is an even simpler example of combining data mining and optimization. So the problem was, in Stack Overflow, you want to know whether two questions are similar. So, you know, you know, if you ask this question, what other questions are similar? This has been done using deep learning methods, uh, particularly by a reference I've lost here. Now, the deep learning method took a fair while to run. So what my grad student, Suvadeep, did, he said, I'm going to take all the options we're going to explore. First, I'm going to cluster them with k-means, and I think all of you know what a k-means cluster is. Then I'm going to run my optimizer per cluster. And his method was 500 times faster if he only used the one core on his machine, and 970 times faster if I let him use the eight cores on his machine. Now, now, now I'm sure all of you have enough CPU to run and tune deep learning. So you don't need a way to do things 1,000 times faster than deep learning. Oh, sorry, you probably do. But this is a prime example of how simple it can be to combine data mining and optimization and get spectacular improvement. Uh, here, another thing to do is the optimizing controls. Th these are the examples. Remember that grid search example I showed you, where you're the learner has got all these options. Like um, in scikit-learn, what's the default number of trees in a random forest? Anyone know? Who uses scikit-learn? Two people. OK. It's a story. Uh, talk to me about it afterwards. The actual default number is 10. It's a typo. It should have been 100. But they're reporting to me now that they can't change it because so many people are dependent on the scikit-learn default parameters. They can't change things anymore. So in this one here, we tried to improve optimizers choosing the control parameters. Like, like um, for linear regression, there's all these gradient descent things that control linear regression. For decision trees, how deep the tree. Um, for LDA, there's all the initial values for, uh, for um, uh, alpha and beta. For k-means, there's k, how many, how many clusters to pursue. We're choosing those with our hyperparameter optimizers. And um, the improvements are sensational. Now, it's going to take a while to explain this, and I don't have time, but these numbers are the improvement, not the initial number. I'm not saying that I'm, you know, uh, 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 10 to 20 percent, but these are the actual differences between them. Improvements of up to 6.6 in, in uh, what's something called AUC, and in terms of recall and precision improvements, like up to 0.2. And this is using this differential evolution thing, which, if you have five minutes, I'll explain to you, it's really fast to run, just a couple, just a couple of dozen evaluations. And so, so tricks like differential evolution, I'll talk about Bayes parameter optimization in a second. But so far, you, it's, now longer not, it's, it's no longer viable not to do hyperparameter optimization. And it's not the infinite search suggested this morning. It's actually something that can be killed by algorithmic methods and using new style hyperparameter optimizers done very, very fast. Uh, now, one of the most interesting examples, very recent, uh, this was a paper at ICSI, and this is a uh, Luxembourg team, and they were trying to understand vision, autonomy, and self-driving cars. And they had this very elaborate system where the machine learner produced a decision tree on what was really good ways to park the car, and then using the, the constraints in the decision tree, they did mutation within the constraints of one branch. And, and, and that drove a genetic algorithm that found good ways to produce new constraints to drive the decision tree second time around. And they would just go round and round between these two systems. And they could find, even for autonomous systems, they could, they could do, have a dramatic improvement in the speed and reliability of, uh, of their autonomous systems. So I think, I, I, I hope, uh, I saw a few little light bulbs go on when I'm talking there. This idea of combining data mining and optimizing, it's not rocket science. It's stuff that you can do with the tools that you know. That said, that said, I think that this is a very deep ocean. All the examples I've given you so far are shallow end of the ocean. You go to the shore, you put your feet in a few feet and say, this is nice. But there is a very deep dive you can do with optimization and data mining combined. Uh, software is getting too complicated. We're shipping systems that literally we can't configure. 
This is the number of, um, of uh, tuning parameters in Apache over time since its release. 150 at release, nearly 600. This is a 2015 slide. Uh, in, um, in MySQL and Progress, this is the number of tuning parameters. The experience has been a couple of things. People are really bad at picking these tuning parameters. There's a classic example for the word count facility in Hadoop. The default configuration for this one is 210 times slower than the fastest configuration. We, we're used to taking software packages and using their defaults, because hell, it's too hard to tune, right? But it turns out those defaults were set by the package authors on the data they were using. And it may not hold for your world at all. And now we've got very fast ways to explore spaces, even something as large as the 10 to the 9 options in my, in my SQL. Oh, and, um, and also we find in user studies, when you give people systems with 400 options to configure, they only ever use 10, 20. So most of the options we're shipping with our software are never used, which means you know, um, all this lost opportunity for people to be able to do cool things. Now these data miners and optimizers are a way to reverse that. We can release more functionality, more configurable software, and we can use our data mining and optimizer combined to help people tune these things for their particular business context. Now, uh, this is um, now one way. Uh, again, this is an example of how simple it can be. Uh, uh, who's ever used a decision tree? Okay, and so so two broad, many many decision trees. Uh, uh, C4.5 uh, optimizes for the minimizes the entropy of the class distribution in the branches. Uh, CART uh, can do it with uh, minimizing the uh, variance or the GINA index. So if we had lots of examples of this configuration of this performance, we could turn loose CART and we could get a nice small tree that describes the, the uh, trade-off space and you could look at that and show it to a business user and say, this is how to configure your stuff. The problem is getting the examples. Remember how many examples I said MySQL had? like 10 to the 9, it's usual to find, you know, those 400 examples in Postgres, they're not simple Booleans. And even if they were simple Booleans, let's say Postgres only had 400 Boolean variables. Does anyone know how big a number 2 to the 400 is? Does anyone know how many stars are in the sky? Between us and the end of the, end of the universe that we can observe, there's 10 to the 21 stars. 10 to the 21 is smaller than 2 to the 400. Our software is bigger than the universe, and we're asking our people, humans, to explore that space. Of course, that's hard to do. Sequential model optimization. Uh, who, who knows um, Gaussian process models? Anyone? Anyone? Who's heard of the Google Visor, the way Google configures its cloud? Okay, Who's, who know, okay I'll, I'll tell you. Um, Google has methods for watching your application running on a cloud computing environment and reconfigure the cloud environment. And one of its favorite methods is called Gaussian parameter optimization as a scale-up problem. And we'll fix that in just a second. What we're going to do is, this is, this is an active learning environment. What we're going to do is, instead of doing 10 to the 9 examples in MySQL, we're going to pick 20 examples at random. And we're going to build cart trees on 20 examples. Let's say we've got three or four goals. We want the fastest runtime. If we're configuring a web server, we want the quickest response time to, to input requests. And there might be some other goal you care about for a web thing. We're going to build one cart tree for each one of those goals from 20 examples. Right? That's very, very fast, and the trees are very small. Now, I have another one million possibilities how to configure I've, I've got 2 to the 400 minus 20 possibilities on how to configure Postgres. So I could pick, say, 1,000 random candidates. And instead of actually recompiling Postgres and running them on the test suite, I ask my cart trees, what do you think about this? So now the cart trees are making crazy guesses. And they're crazy because they're based on 20 examples. Find the craziest guess. Pick it up and say, OK, this is the one we're going to run next. This is the one that has the strangest performance. Now we don't have 20 examples with labels, we have 21 examples. Reblast everything. Build new trees, what, three more trees. Ask those trees to look at a couple of thousand of unlabeled examples for the craziest thing. Pick that up, evaluate it, now you've got 22 examples. This is called sequential model optimization, where the model built to date is used to inform 
your inquiry into the domain. Um, this, is, this is the standard picture offered for the Gaussian process models. There are two curves on these models. One is the model performance, which is the black line, and the other is the acquisition function. And the acquisition function is, where do I look next? So this, let's say the acquisition function is, pick the point where the model performance is mo most, where, where, the, where the sum of model performance plus, plus variance is maximum. This purple space is the variance known around the black line. Gaussian process models have the property that when you build the model, you not only get the mean prediction, but you get this envelope of uncertainty around it. That's what Gaussian process models are about. You know you can do the same thing with decision trees, right? You know decision trees, examples fall to a leaf, and sometimes a leaf, when on training, all the examples are pure. And sometimes it might be nearly half the examples of one class. You can, you can infer this envelope of uncertainty in many different representations. If I get, let's say I've done two measurements, built a model, here's my acquisition function, and this is the point that's maximal of the variance plus the model output. So there is where I sample next. And now the model's rebuilt, and you can see the variance has gotten smaller. This is the point which maximizes the model prediction plus the variance, sample that next. Can you see the general picture? Find the zone that's weirdest and go there. And you're chopping, chopping, chopping the variance. And this active learning method, this sequential model optimization method, is, is a great way to monitor your cloud environment to find good configurations. Uh, it, has, it has scalability problems. Gaussian process models have scalability problems. But um, who's ever done CART on very large spaces? CART is happy to do 100, 200 variables. CART's total, and if I'm only building trees of, 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 from 20 examples, I'm really fast. These graphs are all these different problems of increasing complexity, logarithmic scale on the x-axis. You are getting harder and harder across here, and these are the run times. These dashed lines are when certain examples just give up and can't do it. The red line is my CART method, my data miner and optimizer working together. Crazy scalability. And now we go into more interesting things. Uh, let's talk about human level validation of AI. If I'm building my tiny CART trees, they're readable. I can show them to business users. One rule of forensic accounting is fraud is more likely if no one can audit a process. Standard optimizers use 100 to 1,000 individuals and run it to 100 to 1,000 generations. Guess what happens if you ask humans to validate 1, 000, or 1, 1 million combinations of what happened? Now, the uh, graph that didn't show up right now, Let's see if I can get it back. Okay, so, so imagine asking a human to see if all these divisions are correct and all these rules are right. What I can do with my cart method I just showed you, this is one of these tiny trees that I built configuring a cloud system. The, um, the gray shows the tree leading to best performance, and on a two-dimensional goal graph, two objectives, where here is heaven, that gray marks out this region here. I can now show users a succinct representation of what takes them to the best goal in the space. I've now got something I can show people, very complicated things. So data mining is great for producing succinct descriptions, as in symbolic data mining. I don't mean probabilistic data mining. So one reason I want to put data mining into optimizers is I can explain complex processes better. Why add optimizers to data miners? Well, optimizing technology knows much more about goals. Um, uh, this, this idea of the Pareto frontier of, of there, are, there are goals where if you improve one thing, you lose on the other. There's so much literature, ideas, research methods into exploring spaces of competing trade-offs in the optimization literature. So if you want to really explore competing ideas with business users, go to optimizers. Data miners do one goal and just give you one tree. They don't tell you the trade-off space. Uh, so we can talk about Pareto frontier and domination. Uh, data miners have uh, their goals baked into them. C4.5 is happy to minimize entropy. With, with optimizers, the goals are a primary modeling construct. I can sit down with a business user and say, this system is successful if, and they give me a list of goals. One of the quintessential examples in literature right now is some New Zealand farm 
which has 15 goals all about fertilization, utilization, and cows being happy, and satisfying a whole bunch of local regulations. This is a problem explored in the multi-objective optimization literature, because they know more about goals. So I like optimizers, because they can, uh, my, my data miners are great, they run really fast, because they've been tuned, tuned, tuned to achieve a small number of goals. My optimizers did run slowly, because they did much more thorough search for a broader range of goals. And I've sped up my optimizers by adding in my data miners, doing this duo thing, putting the two things together. Okay, so why are data miners optimizers? Um, I get massive speed up. Remember I was 970 times faster? Now that approach is just by doing a k-means clustering and optimizing per cluster. Generalizations, optimizers, well, they produce point solutions. They say uh, number of wheels equals six, driver equals Tim. Okay, nationality equals whatever. The, the, the rule can do ranges. It can say, it can generalize from a point to a space. It gives us regions. So, so data miners are much better than, uh, for generalization than optimizers. And if you want human readable models, you can't show humans and ask them to audit the millions of options explored by a genetic algorithm. You have to go do some sort of data mining technology to summarize that space. And so, one of the themes of today is it's not enough to evaluate our data miners just by dot load, dot predict. Repeated theme, many people today, including me. I think there's a better scheme, dot load, dot improve. Improve is inherently an optimization concept. If we want to go to our business users and say, I remember the first time this happened to me. Um, uh, I proudly presented a decision tree to a NASA civil servant, and he threw it off the, 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 uh, the table. I went, what the hell? You just spent, you know, X, to X times $10,000 to get that thing built. And he said, yeah, this only tells me what is. Tell me what to do. Don't give me a description of the current situation. Tell me what to do. And so that's why I decided I need to do more than just data mining and classification. I need to come up with improvement methods. Standard data miners may not understand the nuanced goals we produced. Standard data miners may not understand the multiple nuanced goals we're trying to satisfy at once. Standard optimizers aren't enough. They, they're very poor in explanation, very poor in generalization, and a lot of them assume very CPU-intensive methods. But I hope I've suggested to you it might be interesting to combine data mining and optimizer in an approach called DUO, data miners used by using optimizers. So um, I'm from NC State. I hope you have questions. Uh, we have some answers that may be wrong. Uh, thank you for your time. Are there any questions or comments? The Greeks teach us that every superhero has an Achilles heel. What's the Achilles heel of Duo? You must have a hint. Well, it's currently not supported by the current toolkit. You've got to code them up yourself. You've got to code them up yourself. But, um, you know, it's, hell, even my grad students can do it. Hell, 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 no, no, and they're smart, okay? I can even do it. It's even, okay, so um, uh, other Achilles heels. Um, well, there's a lot of people that want to stick with the current technology as one single technology and don't want to learn new things. So that's, that's the problem. I think we'd have to need a bit of a paradigm switch. Um, I look forward to the day where our business users routinely expect us not just to tell us what's going on, but how to improve things, at which point we all have to uh, do this optimization method. Any other questions? Oh, come on. I just said that your data mining technology is a, is a quaint 20th century thing that we've had a, a few successes in scaling up and now we really have to move to something better than that for the next decade. Surely someone's offended by that. Surely. Is Google offended? Is Google offended? Uh, uh, well, by, judging by the rate at which they hire my graduate students, I would say they're either trying to destroy my lab or, or they really like the idea. Um, most of the cloud computing vendors that I know are doing this sort of optimization method. Um, so no, I don't think Google's offended. No. Okay, I'll tell you a war story. Um, there is a company that I can't tell you what's their, their name, and they often ship, they've got fantastic systems methods 
they're very agile. They can generate three new releases of their system a day and ship it out to their 20 million clients. No problem at all. But some of their tools they ship have got data mining components inside it. If I say, just a second, and I, you know, under NDA, my students come in and start to do parameter tuning on those, on those AI components, they can find dramatic improvements to those AI components. So now I know two things. One, that company is shipping suboptimal components to its clients. Uh, two, there is absolutely a need to do optimizing at agile speed. Like you really can't, you know, it's just a bad idea to burn down more CPU with some crazy large parallelized grid search. Uh, you really, and, and it's also not required. You know, we're finding ways to divide the space to search. So uh, that's a small war story. Anyone ever done any hyperparameter optimization? How do you do it? A grid search. You did four loops, right? Now, there are papers that say a grid search, any numeric space in a grid search, like for I equals 1 to 100 by 0.1, right? So, you know, 1, 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 the, um, the, uh, you're jumping spaces. And sometimes, the, the optimization you want is between the jumps. Now, a gr and, and it turns out different data sets require different tunings. And a grid search that's fine enough grained, ingrained to find the best tunings for all algorithms and all data sets is so slow. Okay. Now, happily, a lot of stochastic methods do much better than grid. And I don't just mean randomly stagger around. I mean methods like reinforcement learning, like the genetic algorithms and the methods I'm talking about. So there's much better. Differential evolution is a really good way to do hyperparameter optimization. So if there are no more questions, thank you for your time.